Welcome everyone, I am Justin Paperni, good to be with you, and today I'm going to talk about this college cheating scandal as it relates to federal prison, ethics, life in federal prison, and part of what I want to cover is debunking the myth about federal prison. Indeed, ever since this scandal broke, uh, reporters have reached out to me, I've been doing interviews all day, friends, family, colleagues have been asking, how are they going to do in prison? What is it going to be like for these actresses in prison? How are they going to manage prison? And besides the fact that uh, I'm not sure they're going to prison, besides the fact that they should absolutely not go to prison for reasons I'll get into, the prison term would not be the hardest part of this experience. So I want to talk about why and debunk um, this issue or what I frequently hear that the hardest part of this experience is federal prison. Let's talk about what's going to happen for all of these defendants and shed some light on white collar crime and how these things unfold. Of course, a case like this for the U.S. attorney in Boston is a game changer for this U.S. attorney. It will advance his career, of course. All of these prosecutors, I shouldn't say of course, most of these prosecutors at some point are going to become defense attorneys. And they use cases like this to advance their career and agenda. And they do so on the backs of defendants who are frankly going through a very difficult and hard time. Uh, the reason that I mention that prison will not be the hardest part of this experience, especially for a white collar defendant, is because what these defendants are living through right now is absolutely, uh, it's torture. It's miserable. And something that I wrote about in my first book, Lessons from Prison, uh, during the last five months of my prison term, uh, I've joked that people knocked that my 18 month prison term was too short. I agree. By federal prison standards, it wasn't that long. Uh, but I really felt like I served five years in prison, the three and a half years I spent fighting my case before I went away. So I say to all of you watching, many of you who, I should, I'm not indicting here, I'm not saying any of you have done it, to those of you who may take some joy in the fact that these actresses and lawyers and high net worth people are going to go to prison, who hope that they get um, poor treatment in prison, let me remind all of you, they're enduring worse right now. The hardest part of this process is the reputational fallout, the shame and pain that accompanies an indictment of reading your name online, of wondering what the unknown is like, what their future holds. And I hope all of you understand that because in the end, many of them are not going to get lengthy prison terms and it's okay, in part because they're, they're not criminals. Now, I've gotten some pushback on this, and to be fully transparent, I will be working with defendants in this case. It's ongoing. It is absolutely going to happen. So one may say, Justin, it is in your interest to say that they shouldn't go to prison because some of them are going to hire you. Whether they hired me or not, there is no need for many of these defendants, including the actresses and others, to go to federal prison. We incarcerate too many people in this country. Many of these cases at worst should be handled civilly. Too few taxpayers understand the expense of warehousing people unnecessarily inside of these federal prison camps, but people want it because they presume and buy into this myth that the hardest part about this experience is actual federal prison. In many ways it is not. Time inside federal prison can be the easiest part to recal recalibrate, to prepare, to jumpstart the next phase of your life. The hardest part can be right now. And it's my goal that all of these defendants, whether they are clients of mine or not, immediately begin to take steps to prepare um, for what's coming. And to that end, I wrote a blog. I'll put up a link to it. And I'm going to cover some topics. Number one, something that any of the, all of these defendants should do if they've committed a crime is accept responsibility. In my book, Lessons from Prison, I wrote about my denials of living in denial, of how living in denial provides some moments of solace, but longer term, it's a recipe for disaster. So I knew that I was lying to the FBI. In fact, I learned when I lectured at the FBI Academy in Virginia that had I not lied to the FBI, they would not have pursued my case. So post-defense conduct is very important. I've talked about that in other YouTube videos. How these non-criminals, who how they respond is gonna determine their fate in many ways. So if they've done it, they have to accept responsibility. They have to speak openly and honestly with their lawyer. Defendants like me lied. I wanted to be seen as a stockbroker, as a good son, as the college athlete from you know USC. I, I didn't want people's perception of me to change. So as a result of that, of trying to keep up that facade, so to speak, I lied. And I made matters worse for those that love and support me. So the first thing these defendants have to do, presuming they've broken the laws, fully accept responsibility. Two, they have to hold a lawyer accountable. 
I'm not going to indict these lawyers. I don't know many of these lawyers, but sometimes some lawyers, especially when defendants have big time resources, they will say, we're going to prevail at trial. We're going to take this to trial. We're going to win. Well, despite the odds, be, despite the odds being so low of prevailing at trial, um, Odds are if they're guilty and they know they're guilty, they, the quicker they accept responsibility, the sooner. It is not in their interest to drag this out for many, many, many months and put on a show as if they're going to go to trial, which has the government then invest more resources into their case, prepare to go to trial while the lawyers get rich at a thousand bucks an hour, and then right before trial starts, boom, they sign a plea agreement. You're going to sign a plea agreement, do it sooner. Why? The fewer resources the government has vested in your case, the better the outcome is going to be. I can tell you that I have had clients who have uh, considered for years going to trial. They ultimately plead guilty and they say, what do you think is going to happen? And I'll say, you pled guilty. It's great. You got the three points for acceptance of responsibility. That's great. But because you took so long and you knew this from the beginning to accept responsibility, the government's going to argue for a longer sentence because you made them invest time and detract from other cases. So to those of you watching, if you're a part of the case or not, if you've done it, the quicker you accept responsibility, the better. And that ties into a, su a second subject. Uh, my second book, Ethics in Motion, and I'm not here to sell my books because I give them away for free. Uh, whenever I begin a consulting relationship with a client, the first thing I do is I ask them to read chapter three and chapter six of Ethics in Motion. In chapter three, I write about an accounting client from Chicago who did not have any criminal intent when he got into business and ended up getting a longer prison term than a client, an accounting client in Florida, chapter six, who admittedly went in business to defraud the government, who found a sense of pleasure in cheating the government out of taxes. So I ask clients to read these chapters because you have a defendant who did not have bad intent get a longer sentence than someone who did who literally woke up with intentions to defraud the government while someone else was swept into it. Well, what's the takeaway from that? Well, as I teach students at USC or NYU and colleges all across this country, the government doesn't care who's more culpable. The government doesn't care if you were swept into it, if your role was more tangential. They do not care. They look at the crime. They don't focus on good things you've done in life, whether you're an actress or an actor, a volunteer, a good father, husband, son, community leader. All they do is judge you for some out of character decisions you've made. So it doesn't matter whether you had intent or not. And I assure you, many of these people initially may not have had intent. It might not have been their idea. They may have been swept into it. Doesn't matter. Too many defendants go to trial, get convicted by saying, I didn't have bad intent. Further, something you have to consider, even those who are much more culpable, and this is exactly what's going to happen in this case, those who are more culpable, who cut deals early, are going to get a more favorable outcome. Does that seem twisted? Does that seem fair to you? That someone who is measurably more culpable, does that sound great, measurably more? I'm not sure that was the best use of words. Um, let me try it again. Does it seem fair that someone who was much more involved, deliberately broke the law for a longer period of time, was influential in bringing people into this, would get a shorter sentence than someone who did it once or twice? Doesn't seem fair. But that's the warped nature of the criminal justice system. And I learned that in my case, as I wrote. I was looking initially at like five years in prison, and my co-conspirator was looking at 18 months, even though he was more culpable because he cooperated and, and wore a wire. I don't begrudge him that. The point is, it does not even matter who's more culpable. They want you to cooperate. They want to advance their career. So presuming these defendants are able to accept responsibility, presuming they're able to work with a lawyer, the next step is an inevitable guilty plea. And then eventually they'll sit for a pre-sentence interview, which is a really big deal. The pre-sentence interview is going to determine a number of factors, including the type of job they have in prison, the bunk. Do they qualify for early release programs like the substance abuse program? Will they get credit for acceptance of responsibility? Uh, so the PSR interview is a really big deal. Experience tells me most defendants uh, don't prepare for it. They're simply told by their lawyers to, to tell the truth. Many of you watching who are embroiled in the criminal justice system have told the truth, and where did that get you? I'm not encouraging you to lie. What I'm encouraging you to do is to be strategic, to be honest, to tell uh, the right story, to have the right narrative. That narrative, if you plead guilty, needs to consist. It's 3.20. I've been up since 4 a.m. The words are starting to slur, so bear with me. It consists of four things. Sentencing videos we produce, character letters we generate, and narratives we produce lead to four things in a narrative, both for a PSR interview and its sentencing. Four things I hope all the defendants in this college campus case focus on. Remorse, identify with the victims, 
lessons learned and articulate to the judge, probation officer, and prosecutor while they will never return to that courtroom. That's something only a defendant can do. So of course you're going to tell the truth, but that doesn't really mean much. You have to get into the details of your life and the circumstances. You've got to change the narrative. These defendants have got to change the narrative because it's one-sided that they're rich, shallow, greedy, arrogant people that walk over people for their own expense and the benefit of their children who suffer, unfortunately, because of their parents' poor decisions. They should be held accountable. It should be civil. They're enduring shame, pain, embarrassment, and fallout every single day. But us as taxpayers do not need to warehouse these non-criminals in a federal prison camp. We don't need to spend that money. They are enduring enough, I can assure you. So as we continue, eventually they'll sit for the pre-sentence interview. Then they'll face a sentencing hearing. It is my wish, and I can tell you the clients or the defendants with whom I work in this case, I will not allow them to outsource all of the work to these lawyers. I get a lot of referrals from lawyers. I like lawyers. But I will always default to a video that my friend Michael filmed with Judge Stephen Boo, a federal judge, who told him that about 2% of what influences him at his sentencing comes from the lawyers. Why? Lawyers are paid to say good things about defendants. Lawyers are paid to articulate why their defendant is worthy of mercy. I've shared this story before. Think of Charlie Manson, the dead murderer. Do you realize he probably had a lawyer at a sentencing hearing extol some virtue about him? Charlie Manson, Bernie Madoff, had a lawyer argue that he should get 10 years in prison. It's what lawyers are paid to do. So I pray these high pride, these actresses and these wealthy people and lawyers embroiled in this case do not outsource all of the work to the lawyers because they're paid to say good things. It's going to come down to what the defendants articulate through their own efforts. And I hope that none of them have regret. See, the myth about federal prison is that it's hard. And there are people in my business, competitors that I'm suing, who will tell you that prison's the hardest part, so they'll take your money. They'll tell you that, uh, hire them, so they'll tell you how not to get your ass kicked in prison. In a minimum security camp, you, there's a lesser likelihood of violence than there is in the Starbucks here in Calabasas. If you act like a fool in the Starbucks in Calabasas, the fight is coming no different in prison. The reality is prison is the easiest part, especially for someone looking at four years or less, with early release, halfway house, home confinement, the First Step Act that recently passed, of course, my partner Sean Hopwood was next to the President of the United States on December 20th, 20th when, this was, when the law was signed into action. So a prison term is not what it used to be, but this myth that it's the hardest part, it ain't so. Hardest part is right now. And that's what I want to convey to all of you who wish for pain and are seeking some enjoyment and pleasure knowing that these celebrities and other executives are going through this. Many of you feel like they deserved it and there's a sense of satisfaction. And um, I have a lot of thoughts on that. I can't cover them all in, in this video. As I begin to wrap up after they're sentenced, they are sentenced to prison, and no doubt some of them will be, although I think many of them should never stand for count or serve time on the wrong side. Uh, they will get designated by the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and you could expect that they would be able to self-surrender. I self-surrendered to prison. Um, I had two months to self-surrender. That was a tough time as well, because you're wondering what the unknowing is like, and wondering what life in prison is going to be like, and wondering how you're going to rebuild your life and career. Frankly, I was excited to get to prison. Frankly, I was excited to get started and rebuild my life. I was, uh, I was ready. I kind of wish I went in sooner. So you can expect all of these defendants who are sentenced to prison to uh, be given a chance to self-surrender, unless some of them obstruct justice or impede the investigation. My co-conspirator, who was cooperating, got indicted on new charges. They ripped up his plea agreement. They remanded him. So there are some instances. You saw that with Paul Manafort. You saw that with Martin Screlly, the Screlly, however you pronounce his name, the farmer bro. They were out waiting to surrender or out pending appeal. They did something that infuriated the judge. They got remanded and they went to prison. In my case, I was able to self-surrender. Presuming the post-defense conduct of these defendants is uh, legitimate while they are on pretrial supervision. I know pretrial service as well. I was on pretrial. I also teach a class at the courthouse in downtown called Keys to Successful Incarceration. Presuming they're compliant on pretrial, they'll be able to self-surrender to prison. And I hope all of them, as I wrap up this video, never buy into the myth that prison is the hardest part. The hardest part is right now. And for some, it can be coming home with a sullied reputation, especially in some of these cases like the lawyer forget his name, a uh, high-end lawyer in New York who I think wired $75,000 to help his daughter get a higher score on a test. 
you know, when I was in my, a stockbroker in my 20s, I made big money, but I got caught up in the lifestyle in Los Angeles, so I spent it all. So it wouldn't surprise me if some of these executives making seven figures a year who are now going to be disbarred and lose everything as a result of this have practically nothing left over. And uh, I'm sure in retrospect, you would have done things differently. And, and even a couple of students from USC have reached out to me. I lecture at USC frequently. My last lecture was on a Friday, March 1st at the Marshall School of Business. And I keep in contact with some students who have questions for me. And one of the students said to me, um, you mentioned something in the, your lecture, and this is how I'll close. Some of the advice I gave for students was, before you make any decision, send an email or a text message or do a favor for a client, or before you have a, a desire to close a deal, think about how every email, text, or favor, everything you do will influence your life in one, three, five, 10, 50, 100 years. Had I given more thought to how my decisions would influence my family or my children, my, it's a little painting for my daughter. You know, she's four years old. I was in prison 11 years ago. I thought about having children. I thought about how I would someday, if I had children, tell them how I went to prison. Had I understood how it could impact their life, I would have, I would have, I would have done things differently. What good is it to make a lot of money today if it's to your long-term detriment? What good is it, or was it? What good was it for these parents to help get their their children into USC? And I went to USC. And granted, it wasn't as hard to get into USC in 1993, but I'm surprised you would actually have to do that to get into USC. It isn't Harvard, as my wife who went to Cornell likes to say, it ain't Cornell. Uh, so I'm surprised and disappointed, and it, uh, it wasn't fair, and it was not a level playing field. So let me wrap up, besides saying, consider how every action can influence your life, that I do believe there should be consequence and punishment. Because I'm saying they shouldn't go to prison doesn't mean they shouldn't be held accountable, and they are being held to account. Every moment, the legal fees, the pain, the shame, the embarrassment, all of the fallout that their kids are going to endure, um, the fallout to their career. And maybe some of you say, great, they deserve it. They're entitled, they're elite, they took advantage of others, I get it. I just don't think they should go to federal prison. I don't think our tax dollars should support it, and they are not criminals, and I wish them well. And last and final disclosure, yes, I will be working with some of them, but if you've watched my videos or read blogs that I wrote all the way back from federal prison in 2008, my position on warehousing people has not changed. So I make the disclosure just to be ethical and transparent, but even if I didn't work with any of them, I'd say the same thing. Hope you found value in this video. I've been up since about 4 a.m., working all day, doing a lot of media over this and working with clients. Now I'm going to hit the road and go spend some time with my family. Thank you for watching. I hope you found value. Leave a comment, subscribe, and like. I'll be back soon with more videos. Bye-bye.